This video is the last one from chapter 15 and deals with some of the patterns of evolution that we've been talking about so far this chapter. There are three main things that we'll discuss in the video. The first one is adaptive radiation, which we've talked about a little bit already, and you did that one simulation on the computer with the pollen peepers that involves that idea. Uh, Co-evolution, which I've referenced in a few of the videos as well. We'll get into that one in some detail. And then the last one is convergent evolution, which in some instances we've referred to as already also. So this is really just uh, getting into some details of some things that we've already discussed in general terms already. The first thing for us to talk about is adaptive radiation. And for you to think about this one, uh, the first thing you need to consider is actually a term from last year that you hopefully remember from environmental science. It's the idea of a niche. Uh, so the way we typically define a niche is just the role of an organism in its environment. The reason this is important is because our definition for adaptive radiation involves the term niche. So what we're looking at for adaptive radiation is when one species gives rise to many species due to the creation of new habitats and niches. So if you remember the simulation on the computer with the pollen peepers, that was a bird species from the mainland that got blown out um, during a hurricane to some islands. They started reproducing on these islands isolated from the mainland species, and over a long period of time, we end up getting a new species of bird. So you can see some of the terms kind of overlap, because technically that's an, an example of adaptive radiation, but we also talked about that one as an example of allopatric speciation, because they're separated from the rest of the species on the mainland. Um, speaking of other terminology, some resources will refer to adaptive radiation as divergent evolution, which is actually one of the graphs that we looked at. If you remember, the divergent graph uh, is going to select against the average for uh, two of the extremes. So just to give you an example of this one, to help tie things together a little bit, uh, there are a species of fish called cichlids. And uh, some of these cichlids live in Africa's Lake Victoria, which is a, a huge lake uh, located in Africa. And there are actually over 300 different species of cichlids, which again are a type of fish, uh, living in this lake. And they're all descended from one common ancestor. The reason there's so many different species is they've diversified mostly based on where they're living in this lake, so like at different depths and then also their food sources. So for example, there's some of them that eat fish, there's other that eat snails, things that eat algae, you see they're called algae scrapers, so they literally like scrape the algae off of rocks and things like that. Ones that eat zooplankton, which are a little, um, not necessarily microscopic, but um, very, very small organisms that are floating in the water. Things that le uh, eat leaves, things that eat insects. So they've diversified greatly based on their food sources. So that alone is enough to separate them and get them to, to develop uh, different species that are all similar to their common ancestor, but definitely very much unique. Uh, the next one for us to talk about is coevolution. So this happens between species that live closely together and commonly interact. Uh, this takes us back to another term from last year. If you remember mutualism while you were working your way through environmental science, uh, mutualism is the idea of both species benefiting from an interaction. So mutualism is one particular type of coevolution. Um, please be aware, mutualism is not the only kind of coevolution. It's just one example. But in terms of mutualism, both species are benefiting. This is something that's represented in your textbook. If we take a look at this picture, it shows the comet orchid, which is a type of flower, and the way it's pollinated is with this moth. Um, the moth has a uh, foot-long tongue, and the orchid has a foot-long portion of the flower, so they match up together perfectly. That moth then can get the nectar that it needs from the orchid. It also has some feathery antennas which pick up pollen and allow it to pollinate other orchids as it moves from one flower to the next. So this is the picture from your textbook. I was able to find another one that does maybe an even better job of showing this. So you can see the structure of the comet orchid and then you can also see the structure of the long tongue on the moth 
these two things go together perfectly. You can see they basically have the same length and like the same general shape, and uh, this way they've co-evolved together. So you can imagine like as the base of the flower gets longer, the tongue of our moth actually gets longer to accommodate that. So they've evolved together in order to work in harmony so they both benefit. Again, think the, uh, the moth is getting the nectar from the plant, the plant is getting pollination from the moth uh, going from one plant to the next. Now, just so you don't think that coevolution is always something that's complementary for both because it doesn't always have to be mutualism, another example of this one has to do with snakes and newts. Um, there are newts that are toxic. They contain a poison, and when certain kinds of gardener snakes eat them, then they end up dying. So what we've actually found over time is there are varieties of gardener snakes that have de uh, developed an immunity to this toxin. So they can actually break down the toxin, they're not affected by it, and then they can eat the newts. So over time, like the, the toxin in the newts has gotten more and more severe, and tolerance in the gardener snakes have gone up and up and up, this kind of thing is almost like a co-evolutionary like arms race where they're competing with each other. You know, the, um, the newt's trying to develop a better and better toxin, whereas the snake is developing a higher and higher tolerance. Uh, keep in mind, when I say they're trying to develop it, it's not like it's a conscious thing they're doing. It just so happens that the newts that naturally have the stronger toxin are the ones that are going to be more likely to survive their encounter with the gardener snakes. So remember, this is not a conscious thing that's happening. You know, that moth did not decide to you know, adapt a longer tongue to suit the comet orchid. It just so happens that the ones that have the longer tongues are the ones that can reach the nectar. They get more resources from the environment, and they're more successful. Um, one other example that I've been talking about since the beginning of the chapter is the idea of cheetahs and gazelles. So cheetahs are extremely fast. Right? They're one of the fastest predatory mammals on the planet, whereas gazelles are also very fast. So if you think about how this happens, well, the cheetahs easily eat all of the slow gazelles. The slow gazelles don't live long enough to pass on their genes and reproduce, so therefore over time, as the cheetahs get faster and faster, so do the gazelles. So this idea, again, of like this co-evolutionary arms race, where one species is adapting to become a more effective uh, predator, whereas the other one is adapting to be a more elusive prey species. So we're seeing uh, coevolution can work in complementary ways in the example of things like mutualism, but it can also work in terms of predation, where species are trying to uh, basically outdo each other in order to either survive longer by evading predation or you know, be able to uh, survive better by catching more food. The final one for us to talk about is referred to as convergent evolution. Uh, in this case, we have unrelated species that evolve similar traits, even though they live in different parts of the world and they don't share any genetic information. So these are things that are living on vastly different parts of the planet. They have very different evolutionary lineages, yet they still have certain traits in common. Uh, the thing to consider with this is that this idea supports the concept of natural selection because the conditions in the environment are determining which traits in a species are successful or not successful. So even though the species in these examples don't necessarily live near each other and don't necessarily pass genes back and forth, so like they're not closely related, they still have a certain set of common traits because those are the best traits in order for them to be successful in their environment. So that's really the whole idea of natural selection. Uh, to give you an example of this, if we compare the morphology of a shark to that of a dolphin, they have the same general shape in their dorsal fin. Uh, you'll notice that the flipper is very similarly formed to the pectoral fin in the shark. The main difference, if we look at their tails, right, sharks swim with like a side-to-side -side motion, whereas dolphins swim with an up-and-down motion, so that's definitely a difference, but they have a very unique uh, kind of hydrodynamic body plan where their body's very smooth, the water very easily moves around them, they don't create a lot of drag. So you can imagine that this is the body plan that is the best adapted for these species to be successful living in the water. The dolphin is a mammal, right? So it's descended from animals from land, whereas the shark has more of a fish lineage. They have vastly different evolutionary backgrounds, yet these two species look 
very, very similar, at least externally. So that's this idea of convergent evolution. Even though these two are not closely related, they have very similar body plans because that's the ideal body plan for the conditions in which they live. Uh, when I was looking up pictures for this, I found one that at first I thought was just kind of comical, and then I decided to include it in here because it actually does make a good point. It says up here at the top, similarity um, indicates common ancestry except when it doesn't. So our example here is Zeus, Darwin, and Santa Claus. Hopefully you're seeing the common thread here, the idea of this really impressive beard uh, that all of them have. Uh, this is saying that just because two species look alike doesn't necessarily mean they have common ancestry. It could be an example of convergent evolution. So that's exactly what we're seeing, actually, when it comes to the shark and the dolphin. You know, these two species look very similar to each other, but they don't have any kind of common ancestor, at least not a, a closely related common ancestor. Sort of like our concept here with Zeus, Darwin and Santa, right? These guys don't really have anything in common other than the fact that they all have relatively impressive beards for us to look at. One idea that kind of goes along with that that's sort of comical is we've got concepts like people start to resemble their pets, right? This little girl looks strikingly like her pet dog, uh, but they obviously don't have some kind of evolutionary lineage. So just because two things look similar doesn't mean they're necessarily genetically related. It could just be an example of convergent evolution. So you kind of have to be on the lookout with that. You know, if you remember the shark and the dolphin as a good example, I think you'll be able to keep on track with that one. So as always, guys, I appreciate you taking the time to watch and make sure you answer the questions at the end of the video. Thank you.